Smith McCoy, uh, and the topic is the Harlem Renaissance. And of course, uh, doctors, before we had uh, our final commercial break, <clears throat> I think we promised that we would try to deal with the significance of the Harlem Renaissance. Certainly, it was a very, very important and significant period in the African American experience as well as in the American experience. But uh, what can we learn from that, or what have we learned from that uh, experience, and what do you see as the uh, follow up in a real sense of the Harlem Renaissance of the period, or is there a follow up? Let's start with you, uh, Dr. Smith McCoy, and of course, Dr. Gloria C. Johnson will give us uh, some additional information in reference to that. Okay, there are a number of parallels between the Harlem Renaissance and indeed the movements that followed it. Um, and I think probably we should even go back before the Renaissance because there, as we say, there was evidence of black letters prior to that, even beginning as early as Felix Wheatley in the 1700s. But the idea of language and how language is used to express a particular mindset or political state of mm -hmm. being. Um, if you look at what's going on in Paul Lawrence Dun Paul Dunbar, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, mm -hmm. in that he had written in dialect and yeah. indeed was prevented from writing in, in dialect in, from any other form other mm -hmm. than dialect. But you take the dialectical writings of, of Dunbar and you can move to some of the things that mm -hmm. um, Langston Hughes or County Cullen did with language mm -hmm. in the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And you can make very interesting parallels between that and what we see in present day rap music, mm -hmm. particularly since Langston Hughes was an advocate of the common person and looking at mm -hmm. that common individual and common experience, mm -hmm. not just the elite, which some of the talented tenth wanted to depend on after the Great Migration brought herds of, of, um, mm -hmm. of formerly rural and uneducated people to the North, not just the talented tenth, but mm -hmm. the common person. And so the rap movement itself is sort mm -hmm. of based out of that sort of Mm -hmm. mindset that this is the art of an underclass that sort of reflects mm -hmm. this idea of the world. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, some of the parallels that you see having, uh, yeah. coming out with the idea of black masculinity mm -hmm. or the place of women in political movements, mm -hmm. and what, indeed, what does it mean to be black mm -hmm. at all? are the same questions that we're asking mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. So these are just different questions uh, applied at a different period. Is that is that what we're saying? I right, think? I think so. And certainly that's been uh, thought about before. Uh, around 19, um, I guess it was about 54, it was about 30 years after mm -hmm. his first dinner for uh, mm -hmm. th through Opportunity Magazine, mm -hmm. Dr. Charles S. Johnson uh, wrote an article about the Negro Renaissance and its significance. And mm -hmm. he uh, decided there that one of the important things that happened from the Negro Renaissance was that many of the people were still writing and still producing, mm -hmm. but that at this point their art was being seen as part of a mainstream art, that mm -hmm. things were being introduced into mainstream American writing. Mm -hmm. uh, so he saw that as an, a, a positive thing, but the, that the uh, kind of revolutionary race consciousness that mm -hmm. had existed at the start of the movement had kind of died out. Uh, that then has, has been uh, re rekindled at other mm -hmm. periods in our own history. For mm -hmm. instance, in the 60s, we have what we call the Black Arts Movement of yeah. the 60s, mm -hmm. where the whole concept of a black aesthetic was discussed over mm -hmm. and over. And uh, with Amiri Baraka, um, Don Lee, now Hotkey Matabuti, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Nikki Giovanni, many others talking about the dialectic between being mm -hmm. black and Negro mm -hmm. and what that meant the changes in terms about what we called ourselves mm -hmm. is very important mm -hmm. then. So again, we go back to the language mm -hmm. that um, Sheila was mentioning. So, and again, after that period in the 60s or so, which runs close to the 70s, I guess, mm -hmm. we again see a, an emergence in what uh, some of us are calling a new black aesthetic mm -hmm. uh, after the, the um, uh, 70s, 80s, 80s writers and mm -hmm. some of the present writers who are again asserting themselves and their right to do and write about what they want to write about and in the way they want to. Mm -hmm. And so back with Langston Hughes's um, statement, his article called The Negro Artist in the Racial Mountain mm -hmm. where he talks about the idea of the uh, what the Negro artist was supposed to do but he declares as a kind of manifesto for the younger writers mm -hmm. that they will write about what they want Wonderful. to do, mm -hmm. uh, when they want to do it, and will mm -hmm. and and the, and how they want to do it, mm -hmm. uh, which became the kind of thing that the younger writers were very mm -hmm. much involved in. But later, many of those same writers mm -hmm. sought acceptance in mainstream mm -hmm. writing as they grew older and and mm -hmm. uh, became more established. Mm -hmm. So we see that kind of cycle mm -hmm. in terms of of uh, development and literature. Mm -hmm. I think, <coughs> Dr. Smith, I think over the last minute and thirty seconds, we have. 
you mentioned the fact of uh, these rap groups uh, being a continuation of, uh, in, in a sense, a continuation of something that was done during the Renaissance. Do you see them uh, becoming a part of uh, the mainstream in terms of African American literature, or do you think that they will always be on the outside of, uh, of uh, the mainstream of literature? Well, I think rap has always been with us. We've just called it different things. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go from, indeed, the dialect poetry to the last poets of the 1960s mm -hmm. and the present-day incarnation of rap, you see that they've always been with us. And indeed, courses being taught right now using mm -hmm. Tupac Shakur's poetry, mm -hmm. it being taught as poetry classes uh, mm -hmm. in at California and at very outstanding universities around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael Eric Dyson has written a book, Between God and Gangster Rap. Mm -hmm. Houston Baker, a noted um, mm -hmm. intellectual, has written about the politics of rap and looking at rap in its relationship to the blues ideology mm -hmm. that preceded it. So I think it will always be with mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies, let me uh, thank the two of you for coming by and just giving us that excellent information about uh, the uh, Harlem Renaissance. I think we know it primarily as an historical movement, uh, but I think that uh, the two of you shed quite a bit of light upon the movement itself, that is, upon the literature and uh, some of the other the authors and some of the other participants in that movement, and we certainly thank you for that. And let me encourage our audience to tune in again next week for another informative edition of Comments. Thank you, and good morning.